All right, welcome to another episode of the Meat Mafia podcast. We have someone summoned Calicrates back from the dead, aka the real estate god. We're excited to have him on, talk a little real estate, talk about what's going on in the world. Calicrates, what's going on? Not much, guys. Just happy to be here. Yeah, we're uh, we're pumped to have you on, and I know we were we were ripping a little bit before you hit the the record button. Um, your your Twitter account has been one of our best follows the last six months. I don't I don't remember how we initially found out about you. It might it might have been on Soul's podcast or something like that. But you know, you give incredible perspective just on finance, mindset, crypto, real estate, et cetera. And one of the things that we were saying is that, you know, we, we talk a lot about food, nutrition, the physical, which is great. But, you know, if you don't have, which is one pillar of the three-legged stool, but if you don't have your finances and mindset in check, it doesn't really matter. Those things all need to balance each other out. So we're, we're pumped to have you on and we're pumped to, uh, to dig into all of it. Yeah, well, let's do it. So yeah. Go maybe, ahead. But maybe a good place to start is just, you know, we know you write or focus most of your attention on, on the world of real estate. Maybe just giving a little bit of context on your background, sort of how you got to where you are today, and then we can dive in with some questions. Sure. So I, I started off in kind of the institutional real estate private equity world right out of school. Um, did that for a few years. I mainly focused on San Francisco uh, office and some kind of hotels on the Eastern seaboard. So mainly hospitality and office with some multi um, and retail sprinkled in as well. Um, but that, that was kind of my main focus. Um, did that. Basically what happened was ended up working my way up to, to junior partner there. Um, and then COVID hit. And obviously the two asset classes that got hit the hardest were office and hospitality. Um, so I don't know how well you guys know how private equity works, but basically you got carry, um, which is your percentage share of the profits in the deal. And obviously when there's no profits, you get no carry. So you're kind of faced with the prospect of working on deals that are dead deals or so mm -hmm. um, for a significant period of time. And I just had no wish to do that because um, it's, it's, I'm not going to say working for free, but you only get bonus, uh, base and bonus instead of base bonus and carry. And the carry is really where you make all your money. So it, I would have been working for essentially free for the next three years, let's call it, um, just because the carry would never have hit because there were no profits due to, uh, due to COVID. Um, so basically around a year ago, I left to start my own business, um, kind of smaller multifamily and, and hospitality and self-storage deals kind of across the entire asset spectrum, but in, in more tertiary markets, less competition, um, just kind of easier to, to just build up. Um, and basically since then I bought in September, bought a 48 unit property for 2.6 million. It's probably worth between six and 7 million now, uh, maybe a little more probably exit that um, in, in October or so. And then also just bought a few weeks ago, a, a 30 unit hotel. Uh, it's basically 30 cottages on 14 acres um, that bought for 2.75 million. We'll see where that goes. Um, I personally think it'll be worth 10 plus by the time we're done with it, um, but it's gonna take some time. And obviously there's kind of some, some headwinds in the economy, but overall it's been an intentionally slow process um, really only focusing on deals that are total home runs. No wish to do 15% IRRs just doesn't interest me at all. Um, so looking for deals that are, that are total home runs, like that 48 unit deal, which will probably be like a four or five X net in a year. Um, mm. and then, um, and do it a few a year. And really what you do is you kind of just do a few a year. Um, obviously you, you have some investors initially and you just kind of start phasing them out. And before you know it, you do two or three deals a year that are netting a couple million profit each. And you're looking kind of sitting pretty. Yeah, that's a, that's an awesome story and, and great uh, great track. I'm really interested. So I think a lot of people will probably relate to what you were dealing with when you were faced with what was happening in your career during COVID. Kind of this struggle that I think a lot of people are dealing with or have dealt with, which is like, hey, maybe I'm in a position in a job where I'm like tethered to <clears throat> tethered to the long term prospects of this business, and I, I'm not fully bought in whether it's because the economics of it or just like the mission of the business. I'm curious, like how you processed all that. Like, you know, it sounds like a lot of it was financially motivated, but were there other things that you were thinking about and other things that you could share for people if they're in a similar situation? Yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot goes into it. So one thing is on the financial side, the way I looked at it, and this was even before COVID, I, I knew I was going to leave eventually. Um, basically the way I looked at it is you can kind of back into it based on your base bonus and like, how many, what, how much equity your firm deploys each year. 
um, you kind of back into how much money you'll, you'll kind of cap out at. And for me, I, I kind of calculated and I was capping out of between like one and 2 million a year. And that's, that's just personally an unacceptable number for me. I would never have been like, okay, like, let me just mail it in and just max out at 2 million a year. I think it's kind of like, kind of embarrassing to just mail it in at that point. Um, so that's one thing is the financial end, right? And, and you can kind of figure out like, and you could do this for everything, it doesn't not just private equity, you just figure out, all right, where would my salary max out at, at this firm? Um, and it's pretty easy to calculate. You can just figure out whoever's making the most and that's it. Um, mm-hmm. Most of the time, it's not more than 2 million. It's almost impossible to be more than 2 million. Mm-hmm. Um, very rare. Um, so if that's not an acceptable number for you, you got to find an alternative. So that, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is I, I just wasn't really a good employee. Um, I just, even though I was technically like a junior partner at that point, like there's still people kind of like above you. Um, so I, I wasn't good at that. I hated taking orders. I hated working on anything that was not like extremely revenue generating. Um, so that would just always great at me. Like whenever I'd be doing something that I thought was pointless or even something like, like you're looking at a deal and like, usually if you're good at real estate, you can look at a deal for 10 seconds and know if it's good or not. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd look at it 10 seconds and be like, this is steals crap. Right. Um, We'll be like, all right, let's just like go through the process. And I, like, I don't want to, like, I'm not, I don't want to waste like 15 hours, like talking through this with the investment committee about just nonsense. Mm-hmm. Um, so stuff like that just re- really graded at me. Um, and the other thing, just the mentality, right? Like I want to personally, I want to know that I could do it myself. And I think that's the entire point of like life is like just being kind of being self-reliant um, and understanding that like you did something, you built this and you'll never get that even as, even as a partner at a firm that you didn't build yourself. You never really get that satisfaction. Like we had deals that had great returns. I'm like, I was part of that, but I wasn't the sole reason for it. Um, and I think that that really factors in something I, I kind of look to take to heart. Um, the other thing I'd say is just being in, in control of your destiny, right? Like mm. say you're, you're at a place and you don't control the direction of the firm. I mean, you're just not in control. Um, and every employee is, most employees are even less control than that. Um, but I'm not, I'm just not really comfortable having other people just in charge of my life. And I think that's just kind of what it is. Um, so really the only way to, to get away from that is to actually run your own business and, and just be full and total control of your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, there's, there's a lot of good nuggets there. And I think something that a lot of people, particularly millennials, um, can relate to is the concept of not being a good employee, particularly if, you know, if you're plugged into the internet or finance, Twitter, or whatever you want to call it, you kind of, you learn to recognize that there's this whole other path out there. And there, there's this whole other crop of entrepreneurs that are monetizing online or figuring out different ways to make money. Um, so it sounds like maybe there was some of that going on there with you that you saw that there was this other path available that maybe had higher leverage than what you were currently doing. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, I would caveat with that saying, just kind of like, you have to be good enough to actually do it yourself. You can't just say like, I'm not a good employee and just be like a lazy, I don't want to curse on that. I've actually cursed on a podcast before my mom. Um, my mom listened to someone asked me not to, so I won't, but uh, a lazy piece of whatever. Yeah. Um, and basically, um, basically you kind of have to back it up with your actions, right? So basically mm-hmm. it, a lot of people will be like, oh, like I'm not a good employee. And it's like, okay, but what have you done by yourself while not being an employee? And the answer is nothing. It's mm-hmm. like, you're just not good at anything, man. Like, yeah. it's not like you're like a bad employee. You're just not good, right? And the other thing I think that people really don't understand just how drastically underpaid they are as employees. Yeah. Um, like, for example, that that forty-eight unit deal, right? I made a huge mistake and not. I actually have a business partner too, but um, we made a huge mistake in not taking that down by ourselves. Um, so if we had taken it down by ourselves, which we easily could have, right? The equity check was only eight hundred k. It wasn't crazy. Um, but we wanted to save liquidity for other deals and a lot of things factored in stupid decision. But, um, but basically if you do one of those deals, right. Say we bought it for 2.6, it's worth, let's just say it's worth seven now. Right. I mean, at that point you're already making what people, most people max out at and that's only with one deal. Right. You know what I mean? And that's, that's in one year. Um, so you could, you could easily be making 4 million a year. Um, you do a few of these deals, you're making like five to 10 million a year. And in real estate, when you're a, you're an entrepreneur, you don't pay tax. Um, it's incredibly tax advantage. So I, I don't pay any tax regardless of what I make. Mm-hmm. Um, so that it's one of those things where like, I'm in my first year, really, I guess, second year now of running the business. And this year I'll probably make more than like net than like most MDs at firms they've been at for 40 years, mm-hmm. um, just because of the tax structure and everything. So I just think people don't understand how drastically underpaid they are. Um, 
And it's, it's really just a, a kind of incredible. Do you, so when I think about like this topic in particular, I think about how distorted people's views of risk are when it's like, and obviously a lot of it is it speaks to what you were saying before, where it's like, you have to be able to do the work in order to reap the benefit. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of fear that is pressing on people that really is, I think it's like all just like trapped between your ears. Like it's just fear. That's not fear and risk. That's not really there. Um, is that something that you relate to or is, would, would you, you know, phrase that differently? No, I actually think not only is it less risky on a risk adjusted basis, uh, based on like how much your earnings are, I think it's actually less risky in general, um, mm -hmm. running your own business than being an employee. And I've actually, I had a, a thread that kind of on the real estate God account that showed it in like mathematically how it just, it just doesn't make sense, um, to be an employee, but it's, it's, it's not risky at all. Like a lot of these things especially if you're good. And, and obviously it depends on what kind of business you're in, but in the real estate business, right? Like this, and once again, I'll bring up that 48 unit deal because it's just the easiest example, but that deal, if, if you know real estate, right? There was never a chance that was going to go poorly. It was impossible. We came in at $60,000 a unit. The replacement cost is $250,000 a unit. So you're at like one fourth of replacement mm -hmm. costs, right? Then you have your stabilized yield, which is basically like your unlevered return on the, on the deal, right? And that was double digits, right? Easily double digits. Um, then you have your debt service coverage ratio and we were at a two X plus easily. So it's like that type of deal when you're putting money into it, even if the market dips 40%, or like say we brought it from 2.6 to 7 mil and the market dips 50% even, right? Mm. We're still up. Right? We're, and that's, that is like, that'd be the worst crash since 08. Right. And I, I don't think there's any, any shot of that happening, especially with a cash flowing asset like this. Mm. Um, but it's just, it's fundamentally not risky, right? It's actually really safe. Um, yeah. And I think that's what people don't understand is they're like, oh, if you're going in on your own, it's like, okay. But like, if you end up buying a business that's very safe in that process, it's actually, it's actually way safer. Meanwhile, they're working at these mm. private equity firms that are taking out massive amounts of leverage, like pulling down credit lines, um, doing horrible deals, y yanking up their, uh, their inflation on, on their rent to, to be like 5% and lowering the cap rate on the exit. And they're getting, they're, they're getting to like a 15% IRR. And it's like, that's actually way riskier. These people don't realize that, but that, that's fundamentally way riskier. And yeah, you still have, you're not like directly involved with it because you're working for the company and you're on a salary and everything. But if a few of those deals go bad, you're getting fired. Right. And then you have, you don't even have income to fall back on or anything. So I think it's one of those things where everyone's kind of taught it's the safe path. But the interesting thing is, everyone I know is an entrepreneur knows it's actually way safer to be an entrepreneur. Once again, as long as you're good at it and don't choose like a, a ridiculous line of business or, or also an idiot. But I think in general, it's just way less risky. Mm -hmm. Do you think the, um, the online brand that you built up the last few years gave you confidence to actually pull the trigger in the beginning of COVID when you were ready to make the move? It certainly, it certainly helps. I mm -hmm. wouldn't say it's the, the one thing that, that gave me the confidence. I, I yeah. would have done it regardless, but the, I guess the, the big issue with real estate in general and why most people end up waiting until they're like 40 to run their own business is because it's, it's highly illiquid in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Say you start putting money into deals, right? Say you have, say you're doing five deals a year and I, I'm doing less than that now because I'm just being cautious, but say you're doing five a year, right? You put a couple hundred K into each deal. It's like, all right, by the end of two or three years, if you haven't sold out of those deals immediately, which it's somewhat of a short time frame, I mean, you've deployed a few million dollars, right? So you'd be like, you've probably sunk up most of your liquidity. Um, so that, that's kind of the real issue. So what most people don't realize is you can kind of just, you can just pair a cash flow business with it. Right. And mm -hmm. something like online, like real estate, God, I, I make money off that account and you just kind of pair a cash flowing business with an asset. That's like mainly illiquid during the whole period. Um, and it certainly helps. Right. And I, I think that's one of those things where a lot of people be like, Oh, it's impossible to start early. It's like, okay, well, did you try, did you try and look at other things? Did you try and start another business? And the answer is always no, because they don't want yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's actually that difficult. I think in the age of the internet, like it's kind of embarrassing if you can't get to like, even as a part-time gig, like five to 10K a month online at minimum, um, doing something like you could just consult on real estate and make that online. Um, so I think it's incredibly easy to do. And I, I think it's one of those things where you almost don't have an excuse now for not starting earlier because you can always get the cash flow on the side if you need to. Mm. 
is do you think oh go ahead brett no i I was just going to quickly say i was going to say for most people do you think that it comes down to just a lack of taking action and initiative yeah i I think most people are just scared i mean i think there's there's certainly a subset of society that is most likely not as capable or or not capable at all of Mm -hmm. kind of operating in my specific business i guess i think almost everyone can run a business if they like were forced to um but I think some businesses are a bit harder to run than others. Like a service business, I think almost anyone can run. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's mostly just completely being scared. I mean, you also see it with just the psychology with, with stuff like this, right? Um, with, with the market acting the way it is right now, like you just see how scared everyone is. It's because they have no skills, right? Mm-hmm. Like they have no skills to fall back on. They have no confidence in themselves, right? All they were hoping was that number would go up, numbers stopped going up, and now they're screwed. And it's yeah. like, it's, it's kind of hard to feel bad. Like it's like you, you've had so much time just develop a skill set and you'll never, you'll never be scared again in your life. Was there anything in particular about your upbringing, whether it was like sports or, you know, getting a job early that gave you the confidence to take that leap? No, I mean, I don't know if there's anything specific. I definitely played sports. I was, I was a three sport athlete. I played soccer, basketball, and lacrosse. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't anything like that. I've just, I've always been extremely confident. Um, and I, probably even arrogant. Um, and it, it just kind of, I, I don't think there's one thing I'd point to that'd be like, okay, that's, that's what caused it. I think I've just kind of always been that way. And I think I've always said this, it really derives from like just being competent in something. Like mm-hmm. once you're competent in something, it's almost impossible to not be confident. Um, so obviously that takes some time, like, like, and it, it depends on kind of what you're working on. Right. So like when I first started out in real estate, like I was not confident about real estate specifically. I was confident about myself in general. I wasn't confident with about my real estate skills. And then a few years in, I really don't think it takes long in real estate. I think you really get the hang of it. Like honestly, like 18 months in, you should really know a lot. Mm-hmm. Then you start feeling really confident. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you can have like a sense of confidence in, in yourself. That's not related to like specific sectors or business lines. But like you, once you get competent in that business line, that confidence just kind of comes roaring into that, into that aspect as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think there was one specific event, but I've just kind of always had it. Mm. Yeah, what's, um, what, what's, your, what's your general opinion on the idea of, of arrogance? Because I, I personally feel like there's a bit of a misnomer there where, you know, like the difference between confidence and arrogance is probably a fine line. But at the end of the day, if you're not believing in yourself, like what, what are you doing out here? I think almost every single successful person is, is extremely arrogant. Mm-hmm. And I think even people who pretend they're not like someone like Warren Buffett, he's extremely arrogant. He pulls like the whole like marketing where he was like that, like nice old grandpa. Yep. He's probably one of the most arrogant people in the world. And I bet internally, if you could read his thoughts, he would just be the most arrogant person to exist. Um, really what I think the difference, and if you want to get like technical between arrogance and confidence, just being able to back it up. It's like mm-hmm. someone like Michael Jordan, like, he's arrogant, but he backs it up. It's like, what are you going to say? Yeah. <laughs> he's just objectively right <laughs> yeah yeah and that that kind of bothers people i feel like like when you can call your shot and say like yeah I'm, we're gonna do this and you do it um like it doesn't really sit well with a lot of people who aren't in in that person's shoes or on that person's team i, I don't know if you feel the same way but i feel like a lot of third parties are like crabs in the bucket try to try to draw criticism to people who are actually going for it and feel like they you know they're taking their shot well, I think it just highlights just the, the lack of confidence they have in themselves. So mm-hmm. it's just whenever you do something like that and, and you pull it off, it just shows them just even more so how insecure and just incompetent they are. And that's, that's what really makes them mad. It's not anything you're doing. Mm-hmm. Did, mm-hmm. did you get any, like, as you were leaving your job, did you get any weird comments from people as, as you were kind of departing that, that maybe like validated that statement or like pe- people saying things that were like kind of out of place you know, because obviously going for something at a relatively young age stands out at a, at a big institutional firm. Oh, yeah. So at the at the firm level, I actually didn't tell anyone I was starting a business. I was just like, oh, I'm going to take some time off to go find myself. And they were like, OK, this guy's like a kook. And I was like, all right, see you later. Yeah. And that's one of those things that's kind of hard for other people to pull off. I've had friends who left their job and they're like, 
kind of unable to to put the ego aside there. I, I just don't care what anyone thinks about me, really. So like I just I was like, yeah, like I'm just gonna go find myself. And they're like, all right, this guy's like kind of lost it. Let's get him out of here. Um, but personally, I think that's just way way more preferable because no one's breathing down your neck, you know. And you just kind of like you just fade into the darkness. You kind of fade out of their mind. And if you want to kind of re- rekindle something later on, you could do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dude, one of the things that I love that you say is not to listen to other people's advice, which I think is really contrarian now. And it seems like I see it a lot with my friends is like they're trying to latch on to every single piece of advice that they they possibly can. And there's no possibility for like their gut instinct to come in because they're just taking so many inputs in. Um, Can you expand on that? Because I think it's just that's really going to be helpful for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, I think like you're saying, right? So say you go on Twitter, TikTok, whatever it is, maybe you're watching the news, whatever it is, you're in school and you're listening to teachers. I mean, if all you're doing is listening to what they're saying, you're never training your body, your brain, or your gut to, to think for yourself, right? So you're in situations and you see this all the time with people, especially like New York City is a huge issue with this, um, where like these people have just been coddled their entire lives and like they followed a track, right? They started out at like a great prep school. Then they went to... Yep whatever, a great college, then they're in banking, blah, blah, blah. And like, they've never actually made a decision for themselves. Yep. It's the type of person where if you sat them down like one day in like a business and you were like, hey, like you have to do A or B, like what are you going to choose? And they, they would just sit there for hours, right? These people have never made a decision in their lives, never made a quick decision and they just don't know how to, right? They don't know how to weigh risk. Mm. And that's, that's one of the most important things and almost something that I think is, is very much, not fully innate, but very much innate, You'll see these people, and this is actually a huge pushback I have on whenever someone says, oh, like, I have experience. It's like, okay, but like, if you were an idiot before the experience, you're likely still an idiot now. <laughs> and like, the experience didn't change that. And I, I like to think of it as like a risk reward calculator. And a, 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 like extreme example of this would be someone who's on a bike and they're wearing a, a mask for COVID, but not a bike helmet, right? And like, I've seen that before. And these, it's just like, it shows just like you literally have no understanding of risk. Like yeah. the you, statistics just escape you. And it's just someone like that, you can look at them and be like, there's no way he's a good investor. Zero shot. Because yeah. it pervades it pervades every other part of your life. Right? Like, and, and people don't, a good way of judging that too is like, if someone makes bad decisions with like their spouse or just bad long-term decisions with friends, stuff like that, they're almost always horrible investors. Mm. Very, very rare that they're good investors. Sometimes you have someone who's like insane and that's kind of a different thing because they get so risky that they get lucky sometimes on moonshots, but almost always horrible investors when they make decisions like that. So it really pervades just all parts of your life. But to get back to the initial point, yeah, if you don't train your gut, you're never going to make good decisions. And you need to train it from the beginning, right? Like that's one, that's another reason why I actually hate when people say like, oh, I've been DCAing into the S&P and that's all I do with my money. It's like, okay, like if you ever need to make a real investment decision, you have no baseline. You have no barometer for anything else. You don't even know what risk is. Right? Like you can look, you, you've never looked at other investments. You have no idea, right? So once you start managing larger amounts of money and you're like, I want to diversify to the S&P, what are you going to do, right? Like your, your brain has not been trained to make those decisions. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I never put a dollar into any of those things um, because I want to be able to train myself to look at deals independently, to look at investments independently and to be able to train my gut to actually like think. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's served me incredibly well. Um, and you can kind of tell it's, it's, it's kind of hard to explain, but you can, you can tell when someone just never really made decisions that, that kind of have an impact um, because their brain just not used to it. Just everything kind of flows for them just because they've been following a track. And just once you like force them to deviate from the track, there's just nothing there. Yeah. It, it's on this point of like outsourcing your thinking, which I think so many, like it, it's probably over the past, like few decades, we've outsourced more of our thinking to other people and like, it, it almost makes, it, I mean, it, it makes me think that a lot of people are just like, exactly like you said, just on this track and like, they're, they're not able to get out because they, they know they don't have the skills to make it outside of the, outside of the track. Um, Cause they've outsourced basically every part of their life. Yeah. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing to them. They, they, there's yeah. almost nothing left. You know what I mean? It's just the type of person, like they'll be an employee the rest of their lives and they probably want to be able to, once they rise up to a level where they have to make decisions, they'll get kicked back down because they just, they can't. Um, and I think to a large degree, the last the economic climate in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so has really rewarded that type of person because mm-hmm. there just hasn't been any pushback for anything. Right? Like mm-hmm. you just have morons raising like $3 billion for their crappy startup. Um, 
and hopefully that ends soon and people have to be like somewhat intelligent again. What, um, what habits did you see form or like solidify as you transitioned into a more entrepreneurial role? Cause I know your, your time management is vitally important once you kind of take the leap and are doing your own thing. I'm curious sort of what, what you realized that you need to sharpen up on as soon as you kind of took that jump. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, I'm actually horrible at time management. I, I, I'm almost bad at anything like that. Horrible at scheduling, horrible at time management, incredibly disorganized. Almost every, I also just like all the work I do, I fit into like short blocks of time. Yeah. Um, and this would actually, it, my, uh, my business partner kind of works late now, but when I was working at, uh, at my job still, and it was during COVID and like I was working from home, like I did most of my work between like 12 and 3 a.m. Mm. And like the rest of the day, I just like, because I just end up fitting everything into these like short patches. And that kind of goes with everything. I'm horrible at managing time. I'm horrible at all those things. I'm just good at like just getting stuff done. So I don't, I don't really have any great advice on the topic. Like I just kind of like have a list and I just try and work through as much as I can. Um, but I, I think in terms of like, a model entrepreneur in terms of doing anything. Like I have no morning routine. I have nothing like that. I, I don't have any sort of structure. It's just like, I just go and do it. And mm -hmm. I, if more stuff needs to be done, I do that too. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have a typical day, but in, but in terms of actual productivity, is it like a few hours of like deep focus work, just like banging through the, the high priority tasks? Um, it depends. Right. So like obviously real estate, when you're kind of on site, it's, it's just very, it's either physical or you're like kind of like talking to people. So it's very, it's very much different from like any intellectual type of work. Um, so today, like I was on site, just getting like, getting a few cabins ready for people to stay in. Um, mm -hmm. And that ranged from just like the other, I was measuring out a unit to renovate. Like there's just a ton of things like that. And on the other hand, I have things where I'll be, after this, I'll probably be looking at a new deal to see if it pencils. Right. Or I'll be writing. I, I have a, a group for real estate a university. I write posts in there. I talk in there. And that's a completely different type of work. Mm -hmm. um, to some degree, I think it kind of complements each other because you can't do a ton of intellectual work in a day. Uh, it's one of those things that's almost impossible. If you're doing like, if you're like a writer, right? It's hard to write like, and get in the zone for more than three to five hours a day. Yeah. Um, but if you're kind of going out, exercising, like getting on property, like doing stuff like that it kind of makes it easier to write sometimes. Um, so I think, I think to some degree it complements each other. On another degree, sometimes it's just hard to like switch from one to the other. So it, it really depends. Mm -hmm. Speaking of writing, one thing that we've noticed is that you have a, on Twitter, you have a really unique and direct style of writing. Is that something that you've just developed over time? Or is that something that just comes natural to you? It's, it's kind of both. I've always kind of been direct just as a person. Um, I will say there, there are some writers who sometimes I'll just read their stuff and I just very much like their style. Mm -hmm. um, example would be Wall Street Playboys back in the day. I don't know if you guys ever read their blog, love the way they write. Mm -hmm. um, so they've definitely been an influence. And then uh, like Felix Dennis, I would say someone like him is also an influence. Another thing I do is I, I just, whenever, I, I never really read anything that's like that serious, I guess. Like I never read like a business book, like mm -hmm. reading a lot about like mobsters and stuff like that. And I, <laughs> I think it's a very underrated way to like teach yourself how to tell a story. Um, when you read like a biography of someone kind of very interesting and they really draw you in. So a lot of my writing is like kind of structured in that way as well, but like on a business topic, which is, is one of the reasons why I think people like it so much. Was there, um, is, is there any advice you would have given to yourself like in college coming out of college that maybe would have shaped your path or, or, um, you know, made you think differently about what you were going to do right out of your, right out of college? Um, yeah, it's interesting. So like, I guess I'd gone to a good enough college that what I did in college itself didn't really matter. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I think I had like a three, two in college. It was like horrible grades. I actually almost, senior year, I almost failed out. Uh, I had like, the guy just basically took pity on me on like one of my like senior spring papers. Um, but uh I, I just didn't really matter because like I knew I just knew I was going to get a good job just because of the school is and then just because I have like social skills and can interview. Mm -hmm. um, so like, honestly, I would have treated college almost exactly the same. And I pretty much just what I would say is just be as social as you want. Like I just pretty much part of the entire time made great friends. Um, 
and it was a great time. So I, I wouldn't have changed that aspect. What I probably would have changed a little more is be getting like maybe a little bit more serious sooner. Um, just with regards to my career. I mean, in the beginning, when I first got out of school, I was kind of messing around a bit just in the city. Um, but at the end of the day, it wasn't anything crazy. I kind of ended up doing exactly what I want to do. I've always wanted to run my own business. Um, and I did it, did it pretty quickly. So I don't even know if I'd change that much. I, I feel like when you prolong, uh, a, like getting serious in some ways, it builds up like that momentum or like the, the fuel that you need to really get going. Like it, it gives you that extra little push. Like, okay, I feel like I've maybe almost like procrastinated a little bit on getting going. So like, let's, let's move. Is that uh, is that sort of how you felt? Well, you just start getting mad at yourself. Yeah. And I think I, I agree. I mean, I think that's when you start actually making progress is when you're actually like, like almost physically mad at yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And I think most people don't have like the, I think most people don't think highly enough of themselves to get mad at themselves for wasting time because they like fundamentally don't value their time. So mm -hmm. like wasting, it means nothing to them. But like, if you actually think you have potential, then wasting your time means a lot. 100%. That's a really good point. Um, how important has just like overall networking and relationship building been for you and your own success? Um, it's been important. I think really the important thing is getting people to kind of bet on you. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't consider it networking at all. Yeah. Like I've never actually networked. I would never show up to a networking event. I think it destroys the entire purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the entire thing is you need to be valuable enough that like people want to know you. So I think mm -hmm. people kind of approach it from the wrong angle. They're like, oh, I want to go out and meet people. It's like, no. What you do is you become really valuable, but people want to meet you. And if you try and do it the other way, it never works. You just become mm -hmm. a pest. Like you're just like annoying the person who you're trying to talk to because you're not offering anything to value back. Um, so what I, I think what I've been really good at and which I could definitely credit a lot um, in my career to is just getting people to bet on me. And whether that was um, getting the partners of the firm to bet on me to become a junior partner very early on. Um, and I credit a lot of that just to being able, you almost have to act as if you're a managing director, even if you're an analyst. And I've kind of always done that. Um, and the feedback I would get a lot of the time, even as an analyst, is they're like, like, we would trust you to make an investment decision, but we're like, we don't trust you to like care enough about like some like pitch deck. And I was like, okay, that's true. I don't care about the pitch deck. I care about like the actual investment. Um, yeah. So like once you actually, but they, they start to like, they respect you as a person, right? If you're an analyst and you're just kind of like putting your head down and you're just an Excel monkey, no one respects you, right? Like you're just like a guy they give work to. You're like, it's like, it's like you're a plumber. Right. Like you're like, hey, can you get this done? They get it done. But like if your plumber was like, hey, I think there's actually an issue with the house, the way it's structured. If we change this, I think it add a lot of value. That's when they start like taking you seriously as a person. So like it's almost like kind of backing up for a second and focusing on on how you can actually add value to the to the bigger picture. And that's kind of what leads people to start betting on you. Mm -hmm. Um but another another example would be my mentor who's He's probably around like 40 years old right now. Um, his, he complete, runs a complete one-man shop, real estate, private equity. Has like around 250 million AUM. Um, and he, when I need him to, he, he'll come in and, and do whatever is needed uh, with my business. Right? Like he'll guarantee a loan if that's needed. Um, he'll bring an equity partner if that's needed, whatever it is. Um, and a, a huge part of that is just kind of just getting people to bet on you. And a lot of that, just like you just talk to someone enough time, they make, they think you're smart enough. They think you're competent. A lot of it's them seeing a little bit of themselves in you at a younger age, mm -hmm. um, which I think is kind of an art of getting people to, to kind of see that. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it really gets people to, to start, to start betting on you. And that's, that's when it really starts kicking off, I would say. So it's not as much about net, like people do these networking things and they mm -hmm. go really broad. They're like, Oh, I met like 500 people. It's like, okay, would anyone go to bat for you? And the answer is no. Like you need to get people who are actually going to go to bat yeah. for you and it needs to be a deeper process with fewer individuals. Yeah, that's a really good point. I feel like the depth of the relationship is as important as anything. Um, like you can, it, it's almost like your friends too. Like you need a tight knit group of friends who are willing to step up and, you know, when, when things get tough, they're going to have your back. The exact same thing applies to your, your business network or, even just saying, calling it a network is, is almost like diluting the, the value of the relationship. Like it's, it's kind of, kind of just like the wrong way to look at it. It's, it's completely the wrong way. The way you look at almost anything is like in life is you add the value and then people want to know you. It's like, you want people always to be coming to you, not the other way around. As soon as you like 
walk in the door and say, Hey, like, I'd really like to like pick your brain. Someone's like, get lost. Yeah. <laughs> Why would I want to talk to you? Yeah. Most people have no idea even just like how to send a cold email or a LinkedIn message, or even just to get someone's attention. Like, I, I don't think most people understand the fact that when they're writing these messages, like pick your brain, it's like, that's an incredibly selfish way to go about it. Like there's no benefit to the person that's actually reading that message. There's, there's zero benefit. And the, the other thing too, is just the, I think what people just do so wrong is just the unwillingness to demonstrate they've done anything up until that point to like garner your investment, even for five minutes into their, into their, whatever it is, their problem. Yeah. Like if someone says, Hey, like I really want to pick your brand about real estate. It's like, what, like, what, what are you even saying? And then on the other hand, if someone comes to me and they say, Hey, uh, I'm actually working at, um, Blackstone, I'd like to start, go start my own firm. Um, I'm running into this problem. Would you be able to help? Like, yeah, I'd love to help. You know what I mean? Like, that sounds like, it sounds like a problem I can address. But if you haven't shown that you care enough to like actually start the process before I get there, it means like you're never going to start it anyway. Um, and I think that's one of the things that people really mess up with mm -hmm. mentors too, is they're like, oh, like I want a mentor. He's going to help me out. It's like, that's not how it works. How it works is you do it. And then when you hit a roadblock, you ask him for help. Mm -hmm. And then they clear the roadblock and then you keep doing it yourself. It's not one of these things where like, like you're being like carried around. Like you're not like a baby, like you got to yep. do it yourself. Yeah. I, I feel like one of the things I, I appreciate about what you're saying is the do it yourself and just like, kind of like go get your hands dirty attitude, which I think is obviously speaks to like the position that you're in right now. Um, is there anything that you, you do differently th that, you think has helped you along the way? Yeah. I mean, I think with, with regard to that specifically, it's just learning how to do everything yourself, even today, right? Like I'm in a position where like, I don't need to be doing the actual work of the properties, right? Like right. I have people who do that. I, I don't, I don't actually need to do it myself, but I want to learn a lot of it. So like, I don't have to have other people do it. And I kind of have that mentality with everything, right? Like that's the reason why I picked my firm to begin with, right? I could have gone to a way more prestigious firm and I didn't because I wanted to learn the entire process. I wanted to learn how to acquire a deal, to asset mm. manage a deal. I wanted to be on the ground level. I wanted to know how to do every single part of it. And I learned that extremely quickly because I was able to do that. I mean, my entire deal team was me and the CIO, right? Whereas someone who worked at Blackstone or Starwood or whatever you want to say, they work on the highest level of the deal. And if you told them, hey, like, go start a fund and go buy a building right now, they would have no idea what to do. Hmm. None. I've talked to them. I have, I have friends who work there. They're like, oh, I, I guess like, I don't really know. Like we kind of are looking at this right now. I'm like, okay, so like, do you have any thesis that like would actually work? Day one, if we gave you, hey, here's $5 million, could you buy anything? And the answer is no. Um, hmm. So I think that's what you want to avoid is you don't want to be like good within an apparatus, which hmm. is what most people are. They're good employees like at Blackstone. If you took them outside of Blackstone, they would be useless because right. they can't do it themselves. Um, so that's what you want to avoid. And an example of that is even today, right? Like I was a handyman fixing a faucet and I was just like, Hey man, like you mind showing me how to fix this just so I can do it next time. And like, mm. maybe I won't have to do it next time, but like just the fact that I know how to do stuff like that, it can just speed stuff up. You never know one day the handyman's not there and I need to run through, like I can do it. Um, and I think most people's egos are kind of too large for that. They think a lot of this stuff is beneath them which I think there is some kind of validity to the fact that you don't want to be spending your time doing grunt work all the time. Hmm. But the other thing I'd say is every successful person I've ever met is always learning. Um, whereas most of the unsuccessful people I've ever met think they like know everything. Um, so a lot of these scenarios, like if there's ever a chance for you to, for you to learn how to do something yourself completely by yourself, I don't mean like you learn like one part of the process, like that's useless. You need to learn how to do stuff completely by yourself. Like you should almost always take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you were to take some of the most successful people that you know, do the, do you find that they have common beliefs or shared beliefs about money that unsuccessful people just don't have? Yeah. I mean, I think to a large degree, it's incredibly difficult to be successful while having a, a just a liberal ideology in general. Yeah. It's just incredibly difficult. It's just the, the entire ideology just based itself on the fact that you are not responsible for yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and what, like, what, I'm not going to count the, the VCs in Silicon Valley because they're not even building real companies. Like they build these things that are cash flow negative and they get sold. Like you didn't actually build a real company. Right. Um, anyone you talk to who's like built a real company has been like responsible for employees, like cash flow positive. 
very, very few of them have, have liberal beliefs. So I would say just the radical like personal responsibility and just being able to be capable and competent yourself. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, and I think, I think it's one of those things where you just, you rarely see it kind of cross the, the political spectrum. It's, it's one of the reasons why I always push entrepreneurship in general is mm. because it's almost impossible to have bad beliefs if you're an entrepreneur. Mm. Like, first of all, you're just not worried about the other world. Like, like what are you going to do? You're, you're not going to be like just yapping about social justice if you're running a business. No one does that, right? They're too busy running the business. Right. You're not going to be, you're not going to be getting a government handout. You're not going to be doing any of this stuff, right? Like if you're running a business, all you're focused on is the business providing for others and, um, and just kind of making yourself self-reliant, right? Mm -hmm. And in a world where everyone's self-reliant, it's just a far better world. Um, so it's one of the reasons why I think it's so important. And I don't think people really grasp the full mentality of that um, because they're so locked in, but it's like, once you're actually fully responsible for your own life, it's nearly impossible to have bad beliefs. It really is. It's funny you say that one of our, our like principles, like we're obviously writing about health a lot, but a lot of it is just these you know, very simple tactical ways for you to start thinking about your health as this full ownership, like foundational part of your life where it's, you know, you're cooking your meals, you're starting to learn how to actually eat, like go out and get the proper food to put in your fridge. These, I mean, it's basic for a lot of people, but it, it just building these basic principles that people can speak to and relate to. Um, I, I think it's really important when it comes to health in particular. Um, and this is probably the longest we've gone without mentioning steaks or anything on a podcast. So I'm curious, um, you know, what does your health um, or how does your health play into what you're doing on the entrepreneurial side? Yeah. I mean, I think in general, entrepreneurs are, are more healthy just because like, first of all, I think like an active brain just helps you so much. Like mm -hmm. you just can't, you can't be sitting around just like, like sinking into the couch and watching Netflix. Like it just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so I think like your brain is just so active and so healthy. And like, it's, it's one of those things where the rest of your body kind of follows. Um, so I think that's a large part of it. I also think once you start doing more things at once, which you just inherently kind of have to pack more things into your day as an entrepreneur, because you're just responsible for everything. Like the buck stops with you. Um, you're able to just like, it's one of those crazy things where like, if you're doing nothing, you'll, you won't have time for the gym, but if you're working 18 hours a day, like you'll have time for the gym. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, I think that kind of plays a part as well. Um, it's just like, you're, you're just so high energy and so active that like, you're just, you're just doing everything. Hmm. And that's such an incredible mindset to be in too. It's like the energy, it's like the, the, the momentum is just building off of it. And like other people can feel that energy too. It's like you, you go into conversations and it's almost like you're injecting energy and positivity into the conversation. It just makes everyone happier and you have more productive calls, more productive day. It's just, I don't know. We talk about that all the time. It's just interesting to hear you say that. Cause I've never heard that. I've never heard it said like that before, where it's like you have an 18 hour work day yet you you're still in the mindset where you'll go to the gym. Whereas like you have all the time in the world, but because of your mindset, you're not going to go. Oh yeah. I mean, it's how many entrepreneurs have you met that are low energy? There's zero. Like you yeah. can't be a low energy entrepreneur. It's just not possible. Right. It's just, it's actually not possible. It's the same thing with everything though. It's, it's why I want to, like, I push it so much It's because like, if you've ever been an entrepreneur who like didn't have a firm handshake and look you in the eye, no. Mm. Right. Have you ever been an entrepreneur with bad social skills? No. Like, it's just like these things just never happen because once you're actually fully relying on yourself, you're present in your own life. And I think a lot of people just are simply not present in their own life. They just clock in every day. They clock out. They wait for Saturday. They like slam back 20 drinks. And then like next thing you know, it's Monday. Mm. Do, do you think the entrepreneur is built or born to be an entrepreneur? You mentioned like destiny before. I, I wonder about like, you know, I just think there's a lot of people out there who really do just, they're, they're kind of born or meant to be an entrepreneur with whatever whatever they learned at a young age that gave them confidence or, you know, better social skills, whatever it was, you know, I, I just think a lot of people just have like the factor that, that lends them to being more successful on their own. And um, probably most of them struggle being an employee, I would think similar to you. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think on the extreme end, they're completely born. Like someone like Elon Musk, he's born, right? Like you can't, no one's trading themselves to be Elon Musk. You just can't do it. Um, yeah. I do think on the, the lower end level, I think everyone's capable of being an entrepreneur. It's one of those things where in, in America, right? Let's say before pre 1950s, even um, pretty much everyone was an entrepreneur or they're working at a shop that was small enough. Maybe it was five to 10 people where you're essentially like an entrepreneur. You're probably running one entire part of the process. Right. right? Um, 
so they had so much more responsibility. I think that was one of the things that made the U S and I guess every country in general, just like the people just so much better. I think once you start getting this point where like just people aren't responsible for their own lives, you just, you get the result we have now, which is just a populace that just like, it's just like a pretty gross, like mob. I didn't know what to call it. Like everyone's obese, like just like sit around doing nothing and just like, it's, it's kind of hard to explain, but Mm. I think in general, just the, the general populace has just gotten so much worse because they just don't have to be responsible for anything. And I think it's just fundamentally a horrible way to have a country. Mm. When you, when you think about the future, is your outlook generally optimistic or how do you think about the future? I think it depends who you are. I think the future is just incredibly more competitive. So if you're a smart guy in a third world country, that's you're in good shape. Your, your life's going to be way better than it would have been without the internet and the connectivity. I think if you're a mediocre person in a first world country, you're going to get hammered. And like, you kind of, you pretty much deserve to get hammered. You had all the opportunities to, to be successful. Um, everything was handed to you and you just, you just didn't deliver. So like, I think the people kind of deserve it. Are there any opportunities outside real estate that you're interested in? I, I think I've heard you talk about crypto a little bit. Um, which is obviously an interesting one given what's happening in the crypto markets right now, but anything else that you're keeping your eye on is sort of investment opportunities or just things that, that catch your attention as business opportunities. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the world's full of opportunities. Like, uh, it's one of those things where I think right now you can go into almost anything, um, and be successful. Obviously the internet is, is one of those things where it's almost, it's, it's not new anymore, but it's still a new frontier, I would call it. Um, and there's just great potential on there. But I also wouldn't even shy away from stuff like like running a service business, like mm. doing anything. There, there are so many different businesses, even within real estate. Like you can be an appraiser and like probably run a sick business making a few hundred K a year very easily in almost any town in America, right? And you'd be five oh. Xing the, the average wage. You're not going to be a billionaire, but like you'll make really good money. Just anything, even the contractors I deal with. The contractor, when I was working in San Francisco, like the worst contractor there was making like probably like two or three mil a year, just doing like crap work. Um, So I wouldn't even shy away from like those type of businesses either. I think you could easily start something like that. I think the internet makes it just incredibly easy to start a business. I mean, there's just no friction, right? You could pop up a landing page and start selling something immediately. I also think the scale that's offered there is, is incredible. The, the downside is that you have to compete with the rest of the world. Um, so you kind of have to weigh that. The, the upside, I guess, of real estate is you don't have to compete against the rest of the world. You're competing against just the people local to you. Um, so I think it can go either way. Um, and I think there's kind of opportunities and everything. I think crypto too, everyone's down on it right now. It's one of those things where like, like yeah, we, we know most of the coins are Ponzi's. Like you just need to get out in time. And I know so many people who have made life-changing money um, over the course of a year or two in crypto. So I just think it's, it, it is probably the, the best opportunity if you want to moonshot it to get out. I'm not a huge fan of the whole moonshot strategy anyway to begin with, because I think it kind of signals like you're not confident in yourself. Mm. But if you want to moonshot it at a high risk way, yeah, you can, you can easily do it. And you can probably get in now at, at incredible prices. I mean, who knows how long this downturn will, will last in the crypto market, but I'm definitely confident in at least the, the most of the blue chips long term. Hmm. Um, not to change pace too much, but just one of the questions I had for you that I was thinking about prior to us recording, when you got on Twitter and social media a few years ago, did you intentionally create your account to to grow it? Did you expect it to for your account to grow as big as it has? No, didn't expect it to grow this big. Um, it's it's actually one of those things where like in a sense, yes, I did. Like I'm always surprised I don't have more followers because I'm just kind of like an asshole like that. But at the same time, no, I didn't expect it to get that big. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really know. Is um is there any particular reason behind the name? I know you have you have a nice like banner picture of I think it's Versailles, right? Uh, I actually think that's a um a castle. I want to say in Long Island. Oh no way. Yeah, I don't think that's Versailles. I, I, think it's actually, I think it's actually somewhere in Long Island. I want to say like Huntington or something like that, Long Island. Um, the background of the name itself, it's actually, so there's there's two different like historical Calicrates, Calicrates, I don't know how to pronounce it, but there's there's two different historical ones. Um, one of them was like a philosopher. That's not who I made it after. There's another one who basically there was this, blanking on the battle, I want to say like the Battle of like Plataea. Um, 
he he was like it was like the most attractive uh, soldier of the Greek army and he died before uh, getting the fight. And it was like this huge tragedy. So I just mm-hmm. thought it was a funny story. Um, nothing crazy behind it. Yeah. It's like our names. We basically have like a pretty boring story with how he came up with our names. I think people always expect that there's like more there. Yeah. Yeah. Yours. I mean, one of them just from uh, what's it called? Just Godfather. Uh, Godfather. Yeah. So lots of. Yeah. I mean, we, we even found that with Twitter that people just overcomplicate a lot of stuff. Like literally our story is that Clemenza was writing for um, Texas Slim, who does a lot of blogging just on big food and kind of what's gone wrong with the food system. And he just picked an anonymous name, like just a mafia name. And then I was like, all right, well, I want to start writing about this stuff too. So I picked a mafia name. And then we've literally just started writing a bunch of Twitter threads and engaging. And that's how we've grown so much over the last few months. But it was literally just like, one day we just made a conscious decision and started doing it. And it's, you know, it's worked out pretty well so far. So. Yeah. I mean, I think that's just, it's, it's kind of indicative of like everything though. Like you just have to start. So yeah. I think everyone, everyone puts too much emphasis on everything in the beginning. Like my, my private equity company started a year ago. I still don't have a logo or a name. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. That's like, awesome. There's literally, there's nothing to, there's no evidence that it exists aside from the buildings we buy. What well, I, I think that like, uh, Brett and I were actually talking about this earlier. It's like marketing, br- branding is important in some senses, but like marketing, messaging, like executing the actual operations is really all that matters at the end of the day. And like you could you could go in into perpetuity without having a logo or you know you know whatever uh, in terms of branding, but you'll still execute and make make deals. So it's like um, you know I'm sure at a certain point you're going to want to do that, but it, it just speaks to the nature of like people's psychology. They, they want it to look a certain way before they even start moving or they want everything to be perfect. Um, and they let that, that perfect well, get in the way of good enough. I don't even think it's that. I think they don't want to start at all. And they're just procrastinating. Mm. And they let that feed into feed into them, like just accepting what they have. Yeah. And I, I think they, they just are definitely afraid of getting started. Um, because really, if you actually care, the only thing you're focused on in the beginning is revenue. That's it. Or right? like you're just, you're laser focused on that. You couldn't even, I, I remember at the beginning, I looked at like two logos and I was like, this is the, just the dumbest thing in the world. I'm never looking at this again. Like maybe, <laughs> maybe in like five years, when I have like 30 employees to look at it. They can, they can do it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a good point. It's like so many people, they, they put so much emphasis on branding, logo, all this shit before actually executing on the product at all or like their core service and they just push it off and off and off and then at the point to the point where it's like all the momentum's lost and they can't even imagine getting started yeah. right yeah. like yeah no they they have no intention of getting started i think it's just that that's it's literally their biggest fear is that they're going to do something and it's not going to work out they're gonna have to tell people about it yep yeah, that, there's the social pressure of, of uh, taking a shot on yourself is one of those things that it, it, it's so real. I mean, I, I think so many people, there are people who are infinitely smarter than me, uh, more talented, or, or even just like people I see who are working corporate jobs who are incredibly talented and smart, yet that fear just weighs on them for from taking a leap. Oh, yeah. No, it's it's embarrassing. It's one of those things that you should... I would say generously, by the time you graduate college, you should not care what anyone thinks about you. You should be able to walk into a bar, tell everyone there you have AIDS with a, just a straight face and just not care. And if, if, that's, if that's not the case, you have a big problem. Yeah, it's kind of an underrated skill, honestly. Just like there's this book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, and it just like kind of speaks to this point. It's just like, look, if people care, they care, but that's on them. Like you're, you're living your life trying to do what you want to do and like... Yeah, like live how you want to live and it shouldn't affect other people. Yeah, I mean, even more so, I think when you like, when you actually start becoming very confident in yourself, like I I know this sounds crazy to say, but I I just view myself as so superior to them that like, why would I care about their opinion? Like, it's like, it's just so irrelevant to me. And I think it's one of those things that no one wants to say because it sounds so bad when you say it out loud. Yeah. That's really the mentality you need to have. And like anyone who has supreme self-confidence, like inherently thinks of themselves as widely superior to everyone around them. They just do. Yep. hundred percent. Um, Calicredis, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Is it Twitter? 
Usually, yeah, if, yeah, just Twitter. I don't really have any. I actually have zero other social media. Do you have any other like projects that you're working on outside of your your main line of business, like any courses or or other things that um, you know people should be aware of? Yeah, I have. So basically, I have the Real Estate God University, which is it tracks what I do in real estate. So it basically tracks me from like, and I started it, uh, I guess, um, over six months ago at this point, but it just tracks how I'm building up my private equity firm from scratch, which Mm -hmm. I would have given anything to to know this back in the day. Um, So I'm very biased, but I think it's an incredible product. It basically shows you behind the scenes, how I'm doing it, how I build it out, how I make investment decisions, all the real numbers behind everything. Um, I have like weekly calls every week with me if you have any questions. and it's really just everything. So I go through just why I pass on a deal, why, why I go through with a deal, um, how I think through different scenarios in terms of lease up, renovations, everything like that. Um, and it's, it's something that's it's actually pretty fun for me um, because I'm doing the work anyway. So it's kind of fun to explain. And the audience that I have in there and just the audience I have on Twitter in general is just so, so much more intelligent than the general population. Like I could never do this. I tried to do it on Instagram and stuff like that. And it's just like... Like everyone's just a total moron and it's like not fun. <laughs> yes. um, they just, like they ask you just the stupidest things and you're like, okay, like I just don't want your money. Um, <laughs> but on, on Twitter, like the people are actually extremely cool, ask great questions and like so many of them actually apply it to become successful. So it's, it's kind of great and I, I really enjoy it. It's, it's probably a perfect like uh, replacement for your, your, IC, your old IC community where you're, you do feel like you have to really prepare for it and like give actionable reasons as to why you're doing certain things. Yeah. And it, it actually helps you a lot internally think mm-hmm. through deals because once you write something out, you'd be like, wow, that sounds really stupid. Like we probably shouldn't do this deal. <laughs> or you'd be like, okay, that's actually like a very good point. Or you sometimes get to the exact reason why you like a deal because sometimes mm-hmm. it's hard to, you don't really know it's kind of in the back of your mind. So it is pretty helpful once you start like teaching and you just kind of get all the reasons out there. Awesome. Well, Man, this has been great. I think people are going to get a lot of value out of this. Our, our audience kind of spans a, a wide scope, but I think understanding finances and sort of that entrepreneurial drive is definitely important for people to, to get a hold of. So people will definitely get a ton of value out of this and just appreciate your time. And uh, we know you're busy. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, definitely. I like talking to you guys. Let's, uh, let's do it again. Sweet. Thanks, brother. See you in San Diego. <laughs> let's do it.